This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Fables and their first adventure, The Citadel of the Unseen Sun. This Fables adventure is now coming to life in a physical form as six hardcover books, which will be crowdfunded on Backerkit. These adventures have been written by some amazing talent in the industry, including James Hake and yours truly as contributing to it. And it is suitable for characters of first all the way up to 13th level, exploring the dark vampire, vampire ruled realm of Astoya. This series features over 500 pages of content, over 40 monsters, as well as all the maps and tokens that you need to run the adventures. Follow the links in the description below. The hardcover books are launching at the end of November. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We release videos every Tuesday and Thursday, so please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell for notifications so that you can be up to date on all of our content. And a big thank you to all of our amazing patrons for making the work that we do here on YouTube possible. More information on how you can support the channel at the end of the video. But for today, Kelly and I are going to be taking a look at how to play a sorcerer warlock multi-class character in D&D 5e, affectionately known often as the Sorlock. Now, there's a lot of things to love about combining a warlock and a sorcerer. This is known and well-regarded in the D&D community as one of the more powerful multi-classing combinations. So today we're going to look at building a character uh, from first level through to, we might look at eighth level and then talk about how you would go further from there. We're going to talk about how many levels of each class you want to take, what spells, ability scores, feats, races, and all of that that you're going to want to keep in mind when building a Sorlock. There's so much to talk about in how to play this character as a fantastic magical damage dealer with a hefty dose of great utility packed in as well. So let's get rolling. To start off, let's talk about the goal of this character. Our goal is to reach five levels of Sorcerer and three levels of Warlock. Now, there's many different avenues on how to get there, and a few different avenues offer a few different play styles right off the bat. But for the most part, you're going to be great at dealing damage with spells. That's kind of the forte of this character. This all comes from the fact that with three levels of Warlock and five levels of Sorcerer, you are going to have a core of the Sorcerer's metamagic abilities, but you're also going to be able to dip your toes into the Eldritch Invocations that boost up Eldritch Blast. So we're going to be combining metamagic, Eldritch Blast, and Eldritch in Invocations to yield a very, very potent combination. You can have some great combos going on here by having an area of effect spell like Hunger of Hadar, and then also your Eldritch Blast with reliable invocations like Agonizing Blast or Repelling Blast. And then also pairing that with the ability to do things like Quicken Spell or Empowered Spell. So many of the meta magics and the invocations combine really nicely to create a unique package only available to this character. As an example, with this character in a single turn, you'll be able to quicken Hunger of Hadar, dropping that horrific spell on the battlefield, and then using your action to cast Eldritch Blast to knock any foes that weren't in the area into the Hunger of Hadar thanks to the Forceful Blast Invocation. And then on subsequent turns, you'll be able to reinforce this and throw fireballs into your Hunger of Hadar while still knocking more enemies into the Hunger of Hadar with subsequent Elvish Blasts. It's a really amazing combination of both battlefield control and damage dealing and is a very, very rewarding playstyle. One of the things that I always look for when I'm building a multi-class is that when I'm divvying up my ability scores, I can reliably overlap the ability scores of the characters that I'm combining. With a Sorcerer and Warlock, they are both charisma-based spellcasters. So luckily for us, we don't have to stray too far from looking at Charisma and Constitution as our main two. This means that the two classes mesh perfectly and you don't have to stray very far from what you would have done with one or the other anyways in terms of abilities and leveling up. Now, the pack magic spellcasting and the regular Sorcerer spellcasting don't stack together to give you access to higher level spell slots by combining these. When we have an eighth level character as a sorcerer or warlock, unfortunately we're going to have second level pack magic slots and only third level spell slots as our sorcerer because they don't combine together as if we'd multi-class say perhaps a wizard and a cleric. However, 
We can still use our sorcerer spell slots to cast our warlock spells, and we can use our warlock spell slots to cast our sorcerer spells. But more importantly, we can also expend our warlock spell slots using the font of magic class feature to get sorcery points, converting those warlock spell slots into sorcery points that we can use to replenish our sorcerer spell slots or that we can use for more meta magic. And because those Warlock spell slots come back on a short rest, this character now has a much more reliable supply of sorcery points and can replenish their, their sorcerer spell slots by extension. Now, there's a bunch of different ways that you can cheese this out. And that is a surefire way to get your Dungeon Master very angry at you and have a giant bolt of lightning smite your character from the sky. So as a disclaimer... Any of the kind of shenanigans that you can pull off with this, like a character resting continually to get infinite spell slots, or a character that is taking way too many short rests when they're not needed, despite the rest of the party wanting to move on. If you're going to play this build in actual play, I recommend that you avoid that kind of behavior because that will make your dungeon master very upset with you. And don't even poke the bear on whether or not it actually works. And in my experience, a lot of characters love to take a short rest whenever possible. And so the fact that as a spellcaster who's going to have all of these reliable ways to use your spell slots, not just for spells, but for meta magics, you are going to be benefiting a lot more than playing a straight sorcerer would or even a straight warlock. So let's dive into actually building the character, starting off at first level where we're going to choose our race and assign our ability scores. For the purposes of this video, we're going to be using point by. However, if you're using a standard array or rolling, the idea is knowing where to put your best stats. For race though, really you can go a lot of different ways here. I think that one of the best options to choose is the half elf. Uh, the half elf just gives you a really good assortment of ability scores to divvy up, has some cool features, and just feels pretty iconic on the character. So in terms of ability scores, with point by, we're going to max out the charisma with a 15 there. I think we're also going to grab the maxed out constitution with a 15 there as well. Because we're going to be going Hexblade Warlock, we're actually going to get medium armor proficiency. So if we put a 13 in our dexterity and then use one of the half elf boosts to bring that to 14, we're gonna max out our, our, our AC wearing medium armor. Then from there, intelligence, wisdom, and strength, put whatever leftover points you got. I put intelligence, wisdom at 10, leave the strength to nothing. We're only gonna wear medium armor, so it shouldn't be too bad for carrying capacity. Um, of course, the half elf brings our charisma up to 17. And we put the plus one, the other plus one into con. So we end up with charisma 17, con 16, dexterity 14, tens in the, in the intelligence wisdom, and an eight in strength. So one of the most important questions when you're multiclassing is at level one, which class are you going to start with? And I think in the case of the Sorlock, it is best to start with the Sorcerer. The main reason for this is that Sorcerers gain proficiency in Constitution saving throws, which is going to be really handy for all of those concentration spells. Yeah. Also having a good Constitution save can help out in a lot of other situations. But mainly, we're a spellcaster. Good con is important, especially if we're going to be squishy. Luckily, we have the Hexblade to give us medium armor. So we're actually going to be a pretty robust spellcaster. We're going to get into what spells we're going to load up this character with, but I think to be really iconic, to really mesh the Sorcerer and Warlock together, we're going to go with the Aberrant Mind. Not only does the Aberrant Mind fit the theme, but I also really love the expanded spell list that yes. the Aberrant Mind gets, and it feels like it just gives us more of what we want for this multi-class. It's going to give us an expanded spell list. It's going to give us more opportunity to grab some really good warlock spells through the sorcerer side of things, and it's going to make the whole character feel very, very cohesive, I think. Especially because we're going to be multi-classing into Warlock, the Aberrant Mind is naturally going to have those psychic whispers that call to them from an otherworldly patron. Now, the next question is, beyond first level, are we going to multi-class into Warlock right away, or are we going to take a couple more sorcerer levels? And this is where I think the, the answer to this question is, are you actually playing this character from first level or not? I think that unless you are starting out as a higher level character, I think that playing through five straight levels of Sorcerer 
is going to feel stronger at those early levels of play than dipping into Warlock any earlier than that. So for me, I recommend just progress as a sorcerer to level five so that you can get those third level spell slots as soon as you possibly can and then take your three levels of Warlock. The other popular choice here is still starting with Sorcerer, taking one level, but then immediately jumping into three levels of Warlock. This is going to give you your Eldritch Blast, your Invocations. It's also going to get you that Medium Armor proficiency and all of the Hexblade goodies as soon as you hit fourth level with this character. Both are very viable options depending on what it is you're looking for. I do agree with Monty though that if you're playing right from first level, that dip can make the first two to three levels feel pretty weak, whereas if you go straight sorcerer, you're at least dishing out the normal sorcerer package of spells and meta magics that you would normally get. Either way, once we hit level eight and have that five levels of sorcerer, three levels of warlock, we have fully got all the pieces we need to bring this all together, and we're gonna talk about the meta magic and invocation and spell selections in a moment. After this point though, I think we're pretty much just going to advance as a sorcerer from here. We get kind of all those goodies from three levels of Warlock that we need. And from here on out, we just want to get those higher level spells and higher level spell slots so that we get more dramatic and impactful effects. It might be tempting to take one more level of Warlock. And depending on how your campaign is going, that might be a very viable option. If your campaign is going into the high levels where you expect to be able to cast ninth level spells at some point, then you do not want to take the fourth level of Warlock, as that's going to hinder your ability to gain access to ninth level spells. Bear in mind, though, that this character will only get ninth level spells at level 20. So again, if your campaign has no intention of running up to level 20, you might be fine to take the fourth level of Warlock. So we mentioned that for subclasses, we're going to be going with the Aberrant Mind and the Hexblade Warlock. These give us those extra features, that expanded spell list, those armor proficiencies. We're not really going to be fighting in melee as a Hexblade. It's just that the armor proficiency is really juicy. You could go with another Warlock pack here. I just don't think that you get as much bang for your buck out of another one. I do think that depending on your play style, the subclasses are actually completely interchangeable. The thing that yeah. we're really here for is Invocations meets Meta Magic, but we happen to like the Aberrant Mind meets the Hexblade. We think that it gives us the best of everything. But I think that you could totally play this character as a Divine Soul with a Celestial Pact. Yeah. I think that you could play this character as a master of, uh, of both dragon magic and of fiendish magic by having the dragon and the, um, and the fiend pact. I think that you could do all sorts of things with wild magic and a fey pact. And of course, the great old one is always an option here. I really think that any combination works well, although my top three on the sorcerer side would definitely be the clockwork soul, the divine soul, and the aberrant mind. And I, I do agree with that. And I do think, I mean... When we first picked Aberrant Mind, I kind of immediately thought Great Old One. Yeah. But we want that medium armor proficiency. But if you're going for pure flavor, the Great Old One meets the Aberrant Mind is iconic. Now, with both characters, we're going to get two big choices to make. Two meta magic options and two Eldritch Invocations. And I think we're pretty sold on what these need to be. <laughs> I think that for your meta magic options, you need to take Quicken Spell and Empowered Spell. Quicken Spell is going to open up a lot of options for you to continually Eldritch Blast people while dropping important spells on the battlefield. If you mess up the roll on an Eldritch Blast or drop a damage dealing spell and just roll a bunch of ones, uh, Empowered Spell is a great way to just sure things up and make sure that you are the damage dealing spellcaster on the battlefield. I will say it's hard to say no to subtle spell though, uh, and you might get interesting benefits from twin spell. Although remember, you can't twin Eldritch Blast past level five as a character because it already can target more than one target. There could be some interesting options there for taking twin spell. It can be a little bit more expensive meta magic point cost wise, but you got lots of points coming back to you. On the Eldritch Invocation side, I don't really think there's a lot of wiggle room here though. You want to double down on your Eldritch Blast. That is the bread and butter of this character. Yeah. So Agonizing Blast is a must. 
And I think that Repelling Blast for the character that we're building, we love the character that can knock people around into area of effect spells. And we're going to do the same thing with the Sorlock here. Combining a good area of effect spell, like Hunger of Hadar, with Eldritch Blast that can knock people back into it, that's the key to success. And so those are the two that I would take. Now, jumping into spells, it's important to break down whether we're getting the spells from the Warlock side or the Sorcerer side. So for the Warlock side, obviously we're taking Eldritch Blast. We do get to pick one other cantrip here. What would you take? Mind Sliver, maybe? I guess. Uh, we're going to get five cantrips on the Sorcerer side, which I think we're going to go with the classic combo of Prestidigitation, Minor Illusion, Mage Hand. And then for those early levels of play... I would probably just grab Chill Touch and Firebolt. If you're doing levels 1 to 5 as a Sorcerer, that means you're not going to have Eldritch Blast until 6th level. So having a few reliable damage-dealing cantrips is going to mm. be important. Now, for first level spells on the Warlock side of things, our patron being the Hexblade, we can grab Shield here as well. And I think it's good always as a Warlock to have Hex in your back pocket. It's just an easy thing that you can always rely on. There's going to be combat encounters where you can't push the enemies around, where they are always going to make their saving throws, where you can't throw down that damaging AoE. And sometimes you just want to hex them, debuff an ability score, and get some extra damage. I like packing that with, with me as well. For first level sorcerer spells, I think the big one here is absorb elements. I think with us having medium armor, the ability to stand on the middle to front lines, we probably don't want to be on the front lines too often, but hey, if we get hit with something, absorb elements is just going to help us fight back. We may not be a melee character, but you can always choose to hit somebody with melee and you're not losing a lot by doing yeah. it. I also think that, I mean, with the introduction of Silvery Barbs, I see it. I'm probably going to take it. <laughs> there wasn't too much else that stood out to me. There's some good spells. So really, after Absorb Elements from the Sorcerer list, I'd say pick your favorites. I went with Silvery Barbs. And of course, as an aberrant mind, we're already going to have Arms of Hadar and Dissonant Whispers. I guess if you wanted to, you could throw something in here like Tasha's Hideous Laughter or Sleep that you would keep for a couple levels and then retrain out for those just early levels of play. But I love both uh, Dissonant Whispers. It's another great way of driving enemies and forcing their movement. Uh, and it's a great low-level spell to keep, in, to keep around. You could retrain these out for other spells thanks to the Aberrant Spells class feature, but I think they're worth keeping. As we move on to second level spells, again, we're only really going to have a few options from the Warlock side, and I think this is a great great place to pick up Misty Step and Invisibility. I just love having the utility of both of these spells in my arsenal, and we've got the extra spells known that it's from the Warlock side that it's easy to pick them up and keep them. Absolutely. Uh, both, both of those spells are two of my favorite spells in the game, and if you have the chance to pick them up, I always say you should. From the Sorcerer side, this is where we start to see the playstyle that we're aiming for with this character. I would pick up Web and Vortex Warp. Both of these offer battlefield control in interesting ways. Web is your first port of call for being able to drop an area of effect spell and blast people into it. We're already there with web. It's a bit of a smaller area of effect, but if an enemy escapes the web and you blast them right back into it, you're golden. Vortex Warp can just help if there's enemies who are really far away from the web and you can't blast them into it, you can pick them up and drop them into it. You can also bring your fighter and bring them right up to the people who are trapped in the web so that they can start hacking and slashing. There's so much utility here with Vortex Warp. And now I think the character's really starting to come online. I actually think that the power of Vortex Warp is so good that going back to the meta magic options, if you are going to take Vortex Warp, I think I would take Twin Spell over Empowered Spell for Vortex Warp alone. Being able to twin Vortex Warp to teleport two allies or two enemies is amazing. We also had Dissonant Whispers, which is pretty good to twin too. It is true. The Empowered Spell shares up damage. The thing to note with Twin Spell is that you might pick it up later mm -hmm. uh, because of its cost. And it, it is a costly meta magic, which is, I always like Empowered Spell at early levels because it always just costs one sorcery point, yeah. and it does a lot with one sorcery point. Now, because we're an Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, we do get Calm Emotions and Detect Thoughts already at second level. 
These spells are cool, but I might look at trading them out. And with the Aberrant Mind Psionic Spells ability, you can trade them out for any Divination or Enchantment spell. And I do think there's some possibly better options out there. Yeah, I think you can do much better with Hold Person and Suggestion. Uh, so that would be a very easy retrain, although I would might be tempted, depending on your campaign, to keep Detect Thoughts. Detect Thoughts has its uses, and that's where you really need to weigh what kind of character you're playing, what sort of campaign you're in. Detect Thoughts can go a yeah. long way in the right campaign. But in both cases, with Suggestion and with Hold Person, more reason to grab Twin Spell. <laughs> Yes, we're, we're growing the reasons to grab Twin Spell here. Aside from Suggestion and Hold Person, another phenomenal spell for second level is Tasha's Mind Whip, which once again, enchantment spell, perfect for twinning, totally on brand. It's really, really cool what you can do with Mind Whip, especially when you combine it with forced movement effects. Mind Whipping somebody and Repelling Blasting them further away and then they have to choose whether to move attack if they're up against one of your allies and you blast them away after mind whipping them they're out of luck one of the really neat things that you can do is if you forceful blast an enemy into your existing web and then quicken mind whip and now they're stuck in your web but even if they break out of their web they have to use their action to break out of the web but then they don't have their movement anymore because they're mind whipped. The web mind whip lock is an amazing combo. Once we get to third level spells at this point, we're only going to have sorcerer spells with us. But the aberrant mind gives us hunger of Hadar, which is awesome and definitely worth keeping forever, uh, at least for the next couple levels until you get more powerful AoEs to knock enemies into. We're also going to get sending, which I think is also worth keeping. It's just a really cool spell that can have weird world building and adventure design implications. I ne I'll never forget the time that I played in a campaign where the dungeon master told us that we had to deliver an important message over onto the other side of the mountainside. And I said, I'm just going to cast sending. <laughs> If your DM isn't aware of sending, uh, you can really mess them up by having the sending spell. But I, yeah. I think that it is actually one of those spells that is inconspicuous in its implications. Yeah. A lot of people don't think to take it, but once you have it, there are so many out of combat scenarios in a D&D campaign where it's like, I need to let somebody know something and they are far away. Well, if you know the person, you can just send them. Besides that though, I think that both of those spells are going to be really, really good. And Hunger of Hadar is excellent for now. I do think that we might want to train it out as soon as you get access to something like Sickening Radiance or mm -hmm. Wall of Fire or, or something else to knock enemies into that has more of a um, upcasting capability. However, I do think that when it comes to our choices for sorcerer spells, Obviously, we're going to want to take Fireball. I feel like once you have your enemies positioned where you need them to be in the area of effect, you're blasting them back into it. You can drop a Fireball on your Hunger of Hadar on your web, even if you want to blow that web up into a uh, big fire. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of really cool options with Fireball, obviously, but I also think that I would take Slow. Slow is another concentration spell, so keep that in mind that you can't have slow going at the same time as web or ev even hunger of Hadar. But slow is another great battlefield control mm. spell that can just limit a large amount of creatures and you can drop slow on them without having to worry about where your area of effect is and then keep blasting them away from you. And it's just going to give everybody else yeah. the opportunity to mess with them. The, the the speed reduction was slow. It's interesting because slow is normally a spell that warlocks can only access with the Mire the Mind invocation. And I wonder if that's some of the combinations there that are possible. Because if you have a bunch of slowed enemies and are pushing them backwards with Forceful Blast, they might never be able to close against you it's it's really really strong in that respect by eighth level you're only actually going to get access to one ability score increase or feat with this character now because we chose half elf as our race i think your best option here is to go with elven accuracy with all of the eldritch blasts you're going to be slinging applying elven accuracy on top of that is going to be really beneficial 
and just great for a blaster character anyway. There are some other feats that you might want to consider, but that would be my first go-to with this character. As we advance in levels, of course, we will want to max out our charisma score, um, but you may want to also consider feats such as Eldritch Adept so that you can grab additional invocations. There's a lot of really cool choices that you could pick up here that could boost your Eldritch Blast, such as Lance of Lethargy, which now slows targets as well, reduces their speed, making it even harder for them to get out of the things that you blast them into. I also think that taking um, Metamagic Adepts to get the extra two sorcery points, but also two extra choices for Metamagic can really give you more versatility. If you found the choice between taking Subtle Spell and Twin Spell and um, empowered spell, very difficult. This is an easy way to solve that problem. I also think there's arguments here for having Warcaster or Fey Touched. There's a lot of great feats that can really benefit this character, so that can be one of the tougher choices mm -hmm. you have to make. Even Telepathic or Telekinetic can be really cool with this character. Telekinetic gives you an extra bonus action to shove enemies with Mage Hand, although I think with this character you're going to be quickening spells so much that your bonus action is often spoken for. I do really like that you can combine different sorcerers and different warlocks and get completely different play yeah. styles. Yeah. I do think the Hexblade and the Divine Soul makes a really good melee combat Sorlock. Yeah. Whereas the one that we're building is a Battlefield Controller and Blaster, which is also a great way to go. There, there's, there's a lot of different avenues here and you could actually have multiple Sorlocks that feel entirely different on the table. Yeah. Just changing your spell selection, your strategies, your tactics, and of course those subclasses really creates different variations. So we'd be interested to hear from you. Do you like our Aberrant Mind Hexblade? Or would you prefer a different combination of sorcerer subclasses and what spells would you combine them with? I think the result of our Sorlock is very much a blaster with an interesting battlefield control component to it in that we're going to be using that forceful blast we're going to be using those area of effect zones and we're going to be using other spells like vortex warp and mind whip to really augment that but you could go far more gung-ho on the damage dealing with this character i think depending on what choices you make as you continue to level up this character, really from there you're just going straight forward with more sorcerer levels, choosing your favorite sorcerer spells, but keeping in mind how those spells can pair with blasting people around the battlefield with Eldritch Blast, and that's really the fun that you get to have with this character. This character presents such a versatile playstyle that if you wanted to play a bigger damage dealer than the one that we've presented here, you can do it. If you want to go more in on utility or support, you can do that. If you want to go more of a melee combatant, you can do that. It's really limitless in the potential of combining the Warlock and the Sorcerer, and really the only limit is your imagination and which subclasses you think sound the coolest and the way that you want to move forward with it. So if you have played a Sorlock, we would love to hear about the combination of subclasses you chose, your spell selections, and what your big strategies were with that character in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here and want to see more of this content, please consider becoming a patron of our show by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see a sorcerer and a warlock, neither of which are as cool as a sorlock, in play, <laughs> you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. We have plenty more build guides for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the bell for notifications uh, so that you can stay up to date on all of our content. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.